Listo, Leonardo. Hola, ¿qué tal? Muy buenas tardes a todos ustedes. Continuando con el segundo día de la primera semana internacional de investigación, presentamos la segunda conferencia magistral del día de hoy. The Binational Research Effects Between the Museum and Various Partners of the Peninsula, del doctor Michael Wall, de Museo de Historia Natural de San Diego, California, Estados Unidos. El doctor Michael Wall se unió al Museo de Historia Natural de San Diego como curador de etomología en enero del 2006 y posteriormente fue nominado director del Centro de Investigación de la Biodiversidad de las Californias. Actualmente también se desempeña como vicepresidente de Ciencias y Conservación. El doctor Wall es un apasionado de la investigación basada en colección y la exploración regional en 2008. Coordinó el primer BioBlitz del museo en el que se descubrieron 1,035 especies en el Parque Balboa durante un periodo de 24 horas. Actualmente está trabajando para desarrollar recursos en línea que aumenten la accesibilidad pública a las ricas colecciones biológicas del museo. El interés del doctor Ward por la historia natural comenzó con las plantas mientras trabajaba tanto en una licencia en ciencias, una licenciatura en ciencias, como en una maestría en botánica. En botánica en la Universidad de Auburn se interesó en la relación ecológica entre plantas e insectos. Después de completar su doctorado en filosofía en etomología en la Universidad de Connecticut en el 2004, el doctor Ward recibió una beca postdoctoral para unirse un inventario de biodiversidad global organizado por el Museo Americano de Historia Natural y el Museo Australiano. Es un profesor galardonado y becario en Ewil Grid. Recibamos con una, un fuerte aplauso a nuestro ponente del día de, de hoy, el doctor Ward, Michael Ward. Muchas gracias, bienvenido. Welcome. Thank you, Leonardo. I appreciate the introduction. I will share my screen here and get started. There we go. Um, yeah, I can't thank you all enough for inviting me to participate in this week of, of science and, and research. Uh, it's, it's truly an honor. And I apologize that uh, I, I unfortunately cannot give the presentation in Spanish. Um, I, I, I'm ashamed to say that I've lived in San Diego for 15 years and I'm still learning and hoping one day to be able to give presentations bilingually, but today is not the day. So today, what I am going to talk to you about is not a specific research project. Um, not This isn't some sort of cutting edge, pre cutting edge presentation on the research that, uh, that, that I'm necessarily doing at the museum. I'm really coming at this from the approach of uh, being the director of science and conservation at the museum and uh, talk. I want to talk about the power of collaboration to change the world and to think about our binational region uh, differently, or at least in a very collaborative way. But I want to first start off by uh, introducing you to the San Diego Natural History Museum. Um, if you have had the opportunity to travel to San Diego and go to Balboa Park, you've probably seen this big white building uh, within the park. And if you were to go into that building, you would see everything that you would expect to see within a natural history museum. There would be dinosaurs and, and various displays and dioramas a giant screen theater where you could watch all sorts of movies. Um, and this is sort of the public's view of what a natural history museum is. But when I go out and I introduce myself to the general public and say, oh, I'm vice president of science and conservation, I, it's not uncommon for me to be like, wait, you guys, you guys do science there? And yeah, we do, we do science at a natural history museum, but it's just not the public face. We're, we're so used to seeing the dinosaurs and the big screens. And in that tradition of doing science at natural history museums, and particularly our natural history museum, really goes all the way back to 
the earliest days of San Diego. Uh, the museum is getting close to celebrating its 150th year uh, at, as being a uh, active organization. And back in 1873, 1874, this is what San Diego looked like. It's not much to speak of. One thing you'll notice is that there is a centrally placed city brewery, uh, which is some things never change because you can still find plenty of microbreweries in San Diego that uh, make inspiring IPAs or IPAs and various other beers. Uh, but at the time, the population of San Diego was only about 2,600 people. So this is a very, very small town, 2,600 people. And so it wasn't unusual for people to sort of know one another. Uh, and really the way that this, the Natural History Museum was born was actually by people who had common interest getting together to form a club. You could think of it as like a natural history club at your university. It was people who are naturally interested within the natural world coming together. And these weren't people who were, uh, who were scientists by training. They were often people who were scientists or natural historians by hobby. Uh, and so the, 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 as the story goes, uh, the origins of the museum started with a conversation with this man over here, Daniel Cleveland, who was a lawyer, but also a specialist in ferns. So lawyer by day, you know, fern specialist on the weekends, getting together with a guy named Dan Sanford or Daniel Sanford, who is a land surveyor who was really interested, or excuse me, Oliver Sanford, who was really interested in beetles. And so the two of them realized like, oh, I've got this interest in beetles and you've got this interest in plants. Like we should get together and talk because these things are very similar with one another. And those were the origins of the Natural History Museum. And we were established not as a museum, but as a scientific society. So just kind of like uh, um, any, any other sort of scientific society with the objective of the society to study the nature the acquisition and diffusion of scientific knowledge and the collection and preservation of materials pertaining thereto. So there wasn't, they weren't a museum then. We, we weren't a museum then. It was a scientific society. It was a club of people who were interested in natural history, science and conservation in the greater region of Southern California and Baja California. And at the time they were real sort of activists almost. It was in addition to being a scientific society that was exploring interesting you know, uh, issues in this or, or scientific um, discoveries within this frontier at the time, they were also very heavily invested in protecting that nature um, within, within the area because they realized because of their scientific dealings how special it was. And so Torrey Pines State Park and also Anza Borrego Desert State Park, both of these major state parks within the region of, of San Diego County and Southern California, those were actually um, uh, the, the, the beginnings of the creation of those protected areas were rooted in the members of the San Diego Society of Natural History. But for the most part, it was a bunch of old, you know, old, old dudes with beards and, 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 and proudly an occasional lady, which was unusual at the time uh, to have women involved within natural history museums. Uh, this is a woman who was our curator of marine invertebrates for a time very early in the, in the era of the museum. But they were a society that got together and they had meetings where they talked about various obscure things like the embryology of rock cods and surf perches. I mean, it was this sort of reporting out that happened within this society. And it really wasn't until 1920 that um, the museum or the society received a donation to actually create a museum. Uh, and so there were many, many years where the society was just doing its science and doing its natural history thing, but had no sort of public presence. And so uh, 1920 was when that first started and you can see 
annual membership was one dollar a year there and i can tell you things have changed uh in terms of the cost effectiveness of going to the museum now but so here's this history a whole bunch of black and white photographs and things like that but it really doesn't explain the sort of question that i presented to you at the beginning which is like what kind of science do people do at a natural history museum and you know if you watch enough mainstream media and tv shows like um you know the the uh crime dramas and and forensic entomol or forensic uh csis and things like that then the 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 picture of what science is within mainstream media is that there's lots of colorful fluids, there's lots of people sort of staring at them in direct light, all those people are really, you know, uh, stereotypically Hollywood good looking in some sort of way, and they reach a conclusion before the next commercial break. But the science that we do at the San Diego Natural History Museum is, is much different from that. Our uh, labs are well lit. Uh, our fluids are disappointingly uh, colorless, but like Hollywood, all of our staff is incredibly good looking. Uh, so at least we have that com in common with Hollywood. But if we're not staring at these liquids, wondering about things or writing on these clear whiteboards, then what is the type of science that happens in, in natural history museums? And it goes back to this original quote about Oliver Sanford saying, come over to the house and look over my collection, because what we do is what we call collections based research. And we have plenty of collections to work from. There are over 8 million specimens that are housed within the San Diego Natural History Museum and a wide variety of taxa, plants, insects, mammals, uh, reptiles, amphibians, birds, uh, you name it, marine invertebrates, we, we've, we've got collections for them for the most part. And if you look at the distribution of those records, if we drop all those records onto a map, yeah, we've got a global distribution, but not really. Really, we're focused, you can see here, on the Western United States, but you can even focus in even more and realize that we've got a very strong focus in what I would call the Californias. And the Californias being defined by the San Andreas Fault that scoops up through this area and creates a geologic unit that is unique in, and has its own geologic history and its own future geologic trajectory. We are a region uh, and we're united in that. And so that's the reason why the research division of the museum is referred to the Biodiversity Research Center of the California Yuz, emphasis on the S there. Because, you know, and, and it has been that way for a long time. This isn't a recent uh, thing. We've had uh, uh, researchers working across the border in both US and Mexico for an extremely long period of time. And again, it's because this is a region that has its own geological destiny and its own geologic familiarity. And, you know, there's the, unfortunately too much in the news about borders and uh, really humans are the ones who construct political borders it's the wildlife that is is left to suffer with these political borders and the and the ridiculous amounts of money that are spent on uh, these borders that really should, you know, in my humble opinion, being driven towards science. But animals, wildlife, non-human animals, <laughs> right? They don't observe these borders, uh, and and so here we've got some data on a mountain lion, mountain lion M53. Uh, that was geo uh, GPS tracked. And you can see its track over the course of, I believe it's from April to December of 2009. And this is a critter that did not observe a border. It, 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 it says, this is my home range, you know, not this is my home range. It, it doesn't observe this uh, political definition. Instead, it observes this regional definition, this geological definition of the Californias. 
And so that's the way we at the museum sort of think about our, um, our mission is that we are very focused on this region. Yeah, we've got those collections that are from the odds and sods from all over the place. But the vast majority of our work and what we truly consider to be the mission of the museum is focused on Southern California and the states of Baja California and Baja California Sur or the, the, or the peninsula of Baja California. And so, okay, we've got this, this is what our sort of regional mission is, but what it, what's beyond that? What's our, what's our higher calling, you might say? What, it, what is it that we hope to aspire for in life as an organization? And really lately what we've shifted to is a very strong emphasis on biodiversity and conservation. Um, and, you know, the writing is on the wall and there is plenty of scientific research out there to attest to the fact that we are in a biodiversity crisis. In 2018, the IPPBS uh, released this global assessment report on biodiversity and ecosystem services. I think it was the first one that maybe had been issued in 15 years or 20 years. Had very negative things to say about the, uh, the state of biodiversity on a global basis. And they didn't just bring up that, um, that like, oh, poor biodiversity is not doing too well. Uh, they really emphasized within this report, and I rec highly recommend you read it, uh, that, that biodiversity is intrinsically linked to human health and our quality of life. And so to ignore biodiversity is to the detriment of our own health and to our own quality of life. Meanwhile, you've got the World Economic Forum, which is a group of basically um, insurance people and bank people, people who are like worried about the state of the world from a financial perspective and what are the threats to the world that might impact the financial stability <laughs> of the world. That's what their interest is, is. It's not biodiversity. They're interested in what's going to impact the financial stability of the world. And they uh, declined biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse is the third greatest risk in terms of likelihood and severity of impact in this global report 2020. And so, you know, when the bankers and the insurance people are, are really concerned about something that we're literally talking about money, we're talking about our own human health, we're talking about our quality of life. And I really view, you know, um, I, I'm, I've been around a while long enough or whatever to have kind of gone through the way in which the public has treated climate change um, and seen it go from like a, is climate change real kind of thing to where we are, you know, at least amongst most of the, the, the world, uh, which is climate change is a really big issue. This is something we need to be paying attention to, okay? And I, I, I'm, my concern and our, the concern of our organization is that biodiversity collapse is that sleeper topic that hopefully we can get ahead of now so that 20, 30 years from now, we're not going, man, if we had only started then, um, then possibly we could have made a difference. So how, do, how does the museum think that it can make a difference and how does this link back to uh, binational collaboration and, 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 uh, and cooperation towards this sort of higher purpose that we might have. And, you know, for us, a lot of the times it starts for us in these really sort of simple exercises, these really sort of back to the basics natural history um, endeavors, which we call expeditions. And in fact, we add more adjectives to that. And we say multidisciplinary, okay, so multiple disciplines, binational expeditions is what we do. And we've been doing them for the, for, well, really, you can go deep back into the museum's history, and it's been happening for, you know, close to 150 years, but really have revived them within the last, excuse me, 30 years, and these are just a few of the places on this map here that we have done some in recent times. Um, and th there are 
Binational. Okay, well, what does that mean, Michael? That's a good name, but you know, um, what, what does that actually mean? It means the 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 honest and legitimate um, collaboration between organizations and people on both sides of the border. The museum invests a lot of, or, or staff within the museum have invested their lives in developing uh, relationships with researchers on both sides of the border uh, in order to sort of unify, you know, for because uh, we're all united, right, on this common thing. We all love this region. So how can we unify uh, this and, and really make a more meaningful impact? So there's the binational part, right? We got lots of organizations involved and all these icons up here are just a smattering of them. But then what about the multidisciplinary part? It's, it's, it's actually pretty normal for um, people to do expeditions where it's just like the bird people go out or just the plant people go out or just the bug people are going out. And that's great because they can like nerd out and specialize on their own particular thing and, and, and sort of not have to worry about what everybody else wants to do. But what we have found through combining these disciplines and bringing them together on these expeditions is that it really tells a more um, honest story of what biodiversity is doing within our region. And so I go out and I'm along with botanists. I'm an entomologist, I'm a bug guy. I go out and I have botanists along with me and I can, and I can say, hey, I found this beetle on this Choya cactus, you know, let's, uh, what species is this? And we can start making linkages between species because that's really what we're interested in, right? Is how everything's linked together, working together, providing these ecosystem services that then feed back to our own human health and quality of life. And so by having these uh, binational expeditions, it allows us to sort of bounce off of one another and make interesting connections and discoveries but if it was just a bunch of entomologists together, you know, or just a bunch of birders together, we wouldn't have been able to make those connections. And it really has paid off. Um, particularly, I can speak to it personally, that when I go out with the botanists, I'm very interested in insects that eat plants. Uh, and, the, and, and so the botanists will say, hey, Michael, you might wanna look at this plant over here because it's endemic to only this portion of the Vizcaino Peninsula. And maybe there's some interesting bugs on it that are endemic to just this portion of the Vizcaino Peninsula. And so I go over there and I take a look at it and I find some bugs on it. And lo and behold, we just described in this past year, a new genus uh, and species of insect um, because we had made the connection between these endemic plants and the, and the insects themselves. And so we do this work, right? We're generating this sort of really basic natural history information. It's like, what is where, okay? That's really what we're doing with an expedition. And we really want to share and publish those results because the people who can do the most with this research are the land managers. It's the CONOPs and, and, the, and the nonprofits who are invested in land acquisition and land management. And so we really make an effort to do bilingual reports that share out our data in a very transparent and clean, clear way. Um, it's important to us that this data gets into the hands of the people who can use it uh, the most. And so that's like, you know, sort of the basics behind an expedition, but then what comes out of them beyond this that gets fed out to the world who can hopefully use this to make management decisions and think about their land and, or, or the land in different ways. One thing, as I just sort of alluded to, is this idea of species discovery. The world is still filled with undescribed things. There's a lot of the world that we don't know about. And the temptation is to believe that that world is in the tropics somewhere, you know, that it couldn't possibly be in like the desert of, of Southern California and Baja California, but that's simply not the case. We regularly are finding new species uh, on, on a regular basis. And these are binational efforts to describe these things. I don't know if any of you remember from a few years back, there was a little bit of a media blast about this spider that was uh, softball size, uh, which was a little a little bit of hyperbole. And I don't think it was exactly that big, 
that was discovered down in old mine, silver mines in Baja California Sur. This was published by Maria Luisa Jimenez and Jim Barian from the museum and a few other folks. But this is, uh, you know, work between Sieb uh, in, in La Paz and uh, the Natural History Museum. Likewise, within the botanical realm, I think this was published, I can't remember the date on this one, uh, 2019, two new species of plants that were discovered. Uh, and, and again, these are binational efforts to describe these taxa uh, and get these names out there because really the beginning of conservation is placing a name on something. Until we can place a name on it, it's very difficult to uh, incite any action towards conservation. And we need to think of collections as bigger than just the collections of the San Diego Natural History Museum, right? Like that's that's that that's just one asset that is um, that doesn't reflect the diversity of data that is out there. And so we've really focused on trying to develop together with colleagues these com collections consortia. And the most robust of these, and I highly encourage you to check it out if you're interested in, uh, interested in plants at all, is the Baja California Botanical Consortium, which includes uh, the Natural History Museum, as, long, as well as Herbaria do ABC, and at SEEB, and at San Diego State, and Rancho Santa Botanical Gardens. And they've got a, a searchable database, plenty of tools, and a lot of scanned photos. There's lots of really good resources within here. If you're doing any research that is uh, vegetation or based on the flora, and you don't have this on your um, on your uh, bookmarks in your browser, then I, I recommend that you check it out because it, it's got a lot of assets that um, I think you would find of interest. And while that is the most developed, we are doing the similar things in other disciplines. And uh, this was a poster that was presented at a um, at a society meeting. Uh, that featured researchers from uh, from a nonprofit um, in in uh, Ensenada, uh, a research member of the Natural History Museum, and uh, the curator of the collection at UABC about um, the data that is there and unifying it with uh, larger collection databases, so that we're not just looking at pictures here and pictures there and pictures there, but we're looking at the whole picture of data, trying to unify that information in ways. And of course, we also need to think of collections data much broader, right? Natural history museums have specimens. They have herbarium sheets on, on, on uh, papers and things like that, but the world's changed, right? There, and there's plenty of people, there's a whole crowd of nature lovers that are out there that can be our sort of eyes and ears of what's happening within the natural world. And so Naturalista or an iNaturalist if you're in the United States is um, a huge uh, part of what we believe the future of natural history museums will be. And we collaborate again with many organizations in order to uh, gather more data, more involve the public in a variety of different ways to think about our binational region as a collective area, not as this part that's up in the US and this part that's down in Mexico. But as I insinuated, like the overall, our larger purpose, right? Our, our big goal is that, you know, yeah, we want to um, develop this, this, this natural history of the world but how are we going to put it to use? And we really want to focus on putting it to use towards conservation of biodiversity. And just some recent examples of work that has um, transpired regarding that is uh, the San Quentin kangaroo rat, <clears throat> uh, well, as the name suggests, uh, was uh, thought to be extinct in the areas around San Quentin. Um, you know, as you many of you know, a highly uh, developed agricultural area, and it was thought to have gone extinct. But together with Terra Peninsula, researchers at UABC and researchers at the NAT, uh, what they did is they went back and they looked at those historical records that we have because we've got these collections, right? They identified priority areas going, you know what, I wonder if they're still there. And they went out and did a very targeted survey to try to find the San Quentin kangaroo rat and were successful in doing so, you know, sort of resurrecting it from extinction. Obviously, it was never extinct, um, but the world thought it was extinct. And now because of that, Terra Peninsular is able to um, 
think about it in the context of their land acquisition and particularly their public uh, education. Another example uh, has to do with Isla Guadalupe. Um, that uh, This is an island that has long had issues with goats. This is a historic photo, I think, from um, the early 1900s where they say the goats gnaw even the bark of the cypress trees in their search for food. And you know, if goats are eating bark, then there must not be much left available. And that is certainly the case, as you see a hillside here. This photograph was taken in 2000, and it seems like this could possibly be a picture of Mars, except there's goats on it. So since we know there aren't goats on Mars, um, this is really a devastated landscape. And the museum together, right, a binational multidisciplinary expedition with all of our colleagues from all of these other organizations, including a lot of governmental help, went out to the island, surveyed the island, and really had not much good to say about what was going on the island because of the devastation of the goats. And because of that, Dr. Ezequiel Escura, who uh, was working with the federal government at the time, uh, was able to sign a declaration to remove the goats from the island. And since then, the island has truly started to recover and plants that were thought to be extinct have come back from the seed bank of the island. And so not these not plants that are just thought to uh, have been extinct on the island, but plants that were only found on that island, endemic to that island, that, were, that we thought their diversity was lost forever. Have been, um, have been coming back out of the seed bank. And so this is a real uh, conservation success story of how binational collaboration, this multidisciplinary approach to expeditions can translate into conservation action with uh, tangible results. And another more recent example of this is the great work that is being done by Fauno uh, del Noreste. Uh, this is a, a nonprofit organization led by Dr. Uh, um, Annie Peralta and her husband. And together with the museum, this is Brad Hollingsworth, he's our curator of uh, herpetology. Together with the museum, the US Geological Service, various government agencies on both sides of the border, what they have been focusing on recently is reintroducing the California red-legged frog back to Southern California. This is an endangered species of frog that occurs up in the Northern part of California, but has long been gone from San Diego. I think the last time someone has seen a specimen in San Diego was in um, maybe the early forties. Uh, and so it's long been gone from San Diego. I might not have that date exactly right. Don't hold me to that, but it, I know it's been gone for a long time. Um, and so what they have did was worked on getting all the permits in place. And you can imagine this was ridiculously complex dealing with two different governments to try to do this, to get you know, live material across the border, but they were able to transfer eggs across the border into ponds that had been specially prepared uh, in San Diego County. And just the other day, I was talking to um, Brad Hollingsworth, who uh, is was aware of the survey work that's being done there. And they've got like, I think 46 or so uh, frogs that have survived so far. And this was work that was done, I think this was done in February of last year. So this is a good result of, again, of binational collaboration working together to uh, make to, to to build resilience into this California red-legged red-legged frog population, because if populations blink out in one area, then at least we've got some backup in some other area. And then the last sort of conservation-oriented project is one that's closer to my heart, um, and this is a project that I've been uh, been uh, honored to work on with uh, Dr. Uh, Natal Dr. Natalia Rivero Rodriguez that um, she was uh, received a postdoctoral funding and, and from uh, Conacyt um, and started to work in my lab. And I, was, I couldn't have been more pleased to have her expertise uh, up at the San Diego Natural History Museum. And together what we are working on because of her expertise in peninsular dunes 
is uh, arthropod endemism in dunes and how that might inform conservation. People might be like, well, insects and dunes, who cares, man? Um, but it turns out when you start looking into insects that they have a much higher level of endemism within these uh, dune ecosystems than plants or vertebrates. Uh, and so they help us sort of identify kind of the special dunes or the, or the dunes that have the most unique critters associated with them uh, much more easily than, uh, than um, some of the other broader taxa. So we're hoping to uh, turn this into a long-term project uh, where we can uh, use insect diversity to help inform conservation of uh, coastal dunes in Baja California, which in my mind are some of the most wonderful places on earth. Uh, and I certainly want to do what I can to help conserve them. And, you know, the, the sort of grand pinnacle of it all, the thing that we, uh, we all aspire to be, or at least maybe we all, at least I aspire to be, is I brought up the name um, Dr. Ezekiel Escura um, earlier. And um, Ezekiel is, uh, was formerly worked at the museum. He was our provost uh, in charge of science before he went to go on to the University of California to work with the UC Mexis program. And he's an inspiration to our entire organization on binational collaboration and has really been a driver of everything that I've discussed to you up until this point. And, uh, and, and through his work in particular, with uh, the work in the Gulf of California in the development of this movie called Ocean Oasis, which some of you have possibly seen. Um, he and our executive director at the time were awarded a National Conflict Resolution Center's National Peace, uh, Peacemaker Award, which is a, which is a huge, um, huge honor and really was one of the drivers behind the uh, identification of this area as a world heritage um, uh, world heritage center. So you know th these are these are the big goals that we aspire to through binational collaboration and multidisciplinary collaboration. And you wouldn't necessarily know that when you're sitting in Balboa Park and looking at this museum that has got dinosaurs on the inside and, uh, and interesting, interesting exhibits. But back behind these windows, this is where the entomology department is. Back behind these windows, that's where the birds and mammals department is. And there's 8 million specimens that are housed within this museum. And there's a whole bunch of people who care really passionately about the biodiversity of our region and the, the uh, value of collaboration and helping to conserve that biodiversity. And so while this is where we sit, you know, um, on, a, on a regular basis, and unfortunately uh, more regularly since COVID has struck, uh, you know, the, hearts, uh, the heart of the San Diego Natural History Museum uh, really is throughout the region of the peninsula of Baja California. And, uh, you know, I just wanna finish on the note that um, you know, I've got my contact information up there. We really, tr there's, there's a little bit of, uh, and, and this might not translate, translate across cultures, but at least within the U.S. culture, there's this view of scientists at natural history museums that were a bunch of like cobwebbed old men who are like mine, mine, mine. These are all my collections, you know, um, who are selfish with their research and the access to the um, great diversity of things that the organization has to offer. And as the, you know, vice president of science and conservation at, at the museum, I can tell you that um, I personally try to lead through example that that is not an appropriate approach to which to deal with resources that belong to the entire region, not to any individual curator. And I'm fortunate to work with a variety of scientists and researchers who feel that same way. And so this is sort of a plea to you as other people who are interested in the biodiversity and conservation of our region to you know, reach out to the museum, and that's explicitly why my email address is up there. 
um, feel free to reach out. Not everything's going to work out. You know, they might not be good fits, but we can't discover these new and innovative and interesting ways to collaborate together unless we start the conversation to begin with. And so with that, I think I will leave it open to questions. Thank you, Dr. Wall, for your presentation. It's really interesting hearing all the things that you do um, with all of these organizations in the peninsula. Uh, we have a question. Just let me read it to you. Of course. What will be the uh, challenge for the biodiversity studies carried out by uh, the museum in times of pandemic and post pandemic. Yeah, that's certainly a challenge that we are, you know, obviously facing right now. I know that our uh, researchers who are working with uh, Annie Peralta and the Fauna Noreste group on this red-legged frog work in the Sierra San Pedro Martir are hoping to, because it's getting ready to be breeding season or, or egg laying season for these frogs, and they're hoping to do some more cross-border transfers, relocations of these eggs to help bolster these populations. And you know, we are paying very close attention right to what we can legally do, because there are sometimes legal restrictions on whether or not people are allowed to cross the border and all that sort of stuff. And then we're, we're just trying to, um, you know, uh, work like everybody else is, op you know, optimize the opportunities for collaboration, limit the um, exposure to risky situations. Uh, and, you know, this, what we're doing right now, sitting on this screen all together on both sides of the border, uh, is an example of, uh, of the ways in which we can continue to at least talk about these problems and cooperatively work on them. And we work on one side of the border and other folks want to work on the other side of the border. But there's no doubt that it's a challenge. And, and I can tell you, at least personally, like, um, for me, going down and doing field work within the peninsula is, um, it's in my DNA, like it's, it's, it's part of me. Um, and so to not be able to do that uh, is psychologically not good. <laughs> so I'm really hoping that we get this uh, pandemic taken care of sooner rather than later, because uh, I love, um, I, I cherish the relationships that I have with my colleagues um, in Ensenada and, and look forward to seeing them again and walking in the dunes together. Oh, thank you so much for your response. We have a, another, well, it's not a question, it's a comment. And it says, congratulations to Dr. Michael Wall for its, its excellent exposure. Thank you for sharing. And how, how can, I have a question. Mm -hmm. How can research uh, have all these efforts in order to protect our biodiversity and how other uh, disciplines can help with you doing all of this work? Because you do all the like the scientific thing, but how what happened with the social part right exactly 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 yeah and so that is the great one of the great failings um i think of uh, of a lot of the conservation movement that is driven by scientists because you know i have a scientific hypothesis in a in a question that i'm seeking to answer and it's hard for me to you know d get the blinders off and look outside of that and, um, you know, what we have been challenging ourselves to do at the Natural History Museum, at least, is that, excuse me, every time that we put together a proposal for a grant or a proposal for a project, 
we want to we want to think about not just the research outcomes of this, but what the broader impacts of this are going to be with the community and how those are going to be um, how those are going to be realized. And at least right now, the way that we're doing that. Um, and the San Quentin Kangaroo Rat would be the perfect example of that, is by partnering with NGOs who are much more embedded in the community to, um, to, to, uh, to think about the social side of things. Now, that said, I think that it's an interesting idea and one well worth uh, um, exploring is not just thinking about the biological research, but also thinking about the social science research side of things and bringing those together to be more effective in the um, creating conservation impact. And that's what a lot of people are talking about within the conservation world right now is, is that we need to quit this artificial separation between like, oh, there's biological sciences and the social sciences. Like we really need to bring these things together yeah. because clearly doing it the way that it's always been done isn't necessarily working because we're, we're the problems just keep getting worse. Yeah, I think that we need to to do something to, together because I think that there we need a lot of education in that uh, particular uh, subject mm -hmm. because we don't know anything about insects. <laughs> I mean, we. We mo I, I will say that most of the people will get scared of, and maybe we shouldn't. You no, know? sure. Yeah. Our first thing to do is step on it, and we shouldn't right. do that. You know, right. because we don't know what is, why is that insect doing? In yeah. Why is it important? What's it doing? Yeah. How's it? In how's it? How's it? In and, and that's really the the, when I was. Uh, referring to that IPPS report about the state of biodiversity and how they emphasize this isn't just about, oh, biodiversity is declining, but that biodiversity is declining and, and that has impacts on human health because these things provide ecosystem services for us. Yeah. They're the pollinators that are um, pollinating the flowers that are becoming the food that we're eating. They're uh, the, the water, the nutrient cyclers in the soil, all these different things. And, you know, uh, the, it's trying to make those connections, but also in a really culturally um, realistic way. Like I'm, I'm pretty, pretty damn practical. Like I, I kill, I, I squish insects that are in my house, you know, like I, I, that's okay. People have permission to do that. You know? Okay. <laughs> but, but, um, but, you know, there are broader things that we can think about um, in terms of insect conservation, all of these things so that they are um, relevant to the communities that we're working with, um, I think is the key part of it because, you know, a baby step is better than no step. Yeah. Yeah. And there's one uh, last question that it says, how uh, marketing or communication skills will help you, uh, e it will make you easy to let us know what to do and <laughs> how, how can we do that? No, that exactly. I mean, here's like, the, this is like the, the trifecta the the triangle is coming together here, right? That is yeah. that we need, we need the science, the, the biological sciences, or mm -hmm. the, you know, the social sciences. And then we need the those people who are masters of messaging, right? Um, yeah. To, to help bring that together. And so this is, yeah, this is exactly what needs to be happening. And you know, I, I emphasize, oh, we're all really good and collaborative, but we're really good and collaborative within our discipline. Um, and, and, and to make a difference, we, we absolutely have to spread out to include, um, to include all that. That's a fantastic question. I'm so glad that that came in. Well, we're so happy to have you here with us. And we are, I'm going to show you, uh, on the screen, something that we have for you that I will uh, mail it to you. Okay. Okay.
and I'm going to hand and read it. Eh, Universidad de Xochicalco otorga el presente reconocimiento al Dr. Michael Wall por su conferencia de Binational Research Efforts between the museum eh, and various partners in the peninsula, Ensenada, Baja California, signed by myself. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. It's really been an honor and a pleasure to um, get to speak to you all. And I appreciate your um, patience with my uh, my inability to speak Spanish and, and listening to me. I hope it was educational um, or people learned a few things. And I, and I truly hope that some folks will reach out to me. Um, as I said, not every collaboration can become a collaboration. We got to pick and choose and figure out what's going to work out. But um, starting the conversation is critical. And, um, it's really been an honor and I, I, I couldn't be um, prouder to be a part of this. Thank you so much, Nancy. No, you're welcome. And I, like I said, I'm so glad that you accept to be with us today. Y a Leonardo, si haces el cierre. Sí, pues muchísimas gracias. Damos gracias a la participación del Dr. Michael Wall y eh, obviamente de la doctora Nancy Rodríguez Condit por esta excelente presentación que tuvimos el día de hoy. Y los esperamos a las 7 de la tarde con la última conferencia de nuestro segundo día de este excelente evento de investigación que es la Semana Internacional. Muchísimas gracias. Los esperamos a las 7 de la tarde. Muchísimas gracias. Buenas tardes.